I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. I'm Alan Carrasso. Good morning. It is 941 Wednesday, September 9th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And tomorrow is football. So it's the annual test of who can have a worse record, the Jets or the Giants. I am Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I'll take the Jets. Don't you you can never go wrong betting against the Jets, right, Joe? It's true. I should have been hedging this whole time. I should have been hedging my fandom with bets. Exactly. Jonathan Green, general manager from DJ Stable. And uh, man, this has been a wild and woolly week, starting with the Derby and the Oaks and uh, ending with the uh, the big news that's coming down the pipe today. How's that for a teaser? That's a tease. I'm Alan Carrasso, managing editor of the TDN. I apologize for any background noise as I have Carrasso Elementary and Senior High School up above me. And uh, but this is Christmas for me today. It's the opening meet at Happy Valley tonight. Very When's nice. recess, Val? When's what? When's recess? Uh, 8.45, oddly enough. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Al, before we get too far into the show, congratulations on 22 years at the TDN. <laughs> Thanks. You can see it, what it's done to me here. <laughs> are, you uh, saying, no. are you saying uh, that you were handsome before you got the, you know, hired 22 years ago? <laughs> I'm older and grayer. That's what I said, but thank you, John. It's, uh, it's, it's quite been a great, great ride. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland, the industry-leading Keeneland September yearling sale, which consistently delivers the winners on racing's biggest stages, begins this Sunday, September 13th. Learn more about the sale, including remote bidding options and on-site protocols at september.keeneland.com. Huge weekend for Keeneland grads. They swept the Derby and the Oaks. Can't do much better than that with Authentic. And she dares the devil. But uh, some other big wins as well. Global campaign in the Woodward. Getting his first grade one win. Monomoy girl, of course. We know she's a Keelan September grad. Princess Noor in the Del Mar debutante. Bequist in the Spinaway. We'll get to these performances later. Jackie's Warrior in the Hopeful. So almost clean sweep of the grade ones there. And then sitting on go as well. Big upset in the Iroquois. Girl Daddy in the Pocahontas. And Analyze It, who is back in the Red Bank Stakes. Stakes that's near and dear to our hearts at the TDN. Uh, so a huge weekend for Keeneland grads. Keeneland September this Sunday. Toss it to our resident owner, John Green, about what he's looking forward to. Well, actually, Joe, I have to admit that that while you're doing the the, the preview of the uh, the show and the commercial breaks and everything like that, I'm actually cheating by reading the uh, the Keeneland book. So I'm going through it every waking moment that that we have um, because the sale starts Sunday. So you know we have teams that are down there. They can start looking at horses over the weekend and. Get us some short lists uh, for us to review. I can watch the videos online, which is outstanding, um, and communicate very easily you know, with my team down there. And now I can bid not only on the phone, but also online. So uh, they're making it very, very easy for, uh, for the fat cats up here in Jersey, like us, to be able to bid on horses. But I'm going to go back to reading my catalog while you finish up this commercial. All right. Best of luck, John. Best of luck. Thanks for paying attention, as always. And uh, best of luck to everybody at Keeneland for, for th- throughout the Keeneland September sale, and that'll lead right into the fall meet and then the Breeders' Cup. Uh, so I think there was a big race over the weekend. I saw some people tweeting about something or other. Uh, the, 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 Dar- the Kentucky Derby, is, am I saying that right? Uh, so yeah, the, we, so we, we finally had the Derby in the Oaks. We waited a long, long time. Uh, it seemed like years, honestly. It was probably about nine months that we were talking about it. Finally happened, and Tis the Law had dead aim on Authentic at the top of the stretch. Looked like he was going to run right on by. Just couldn't do it. Authentic dug in. They thought they both ran big. I thought the idea that there was some kind of excuse needed for Tis the Law. I don't know. I didn't. I, I thought he he ran his race. Barkley Tag supposedly said he didn't like the track, according to Manny Franco. I didn't really see that. I thought he kind of just ran his race. I ran every other race except the Travers, and that was my concern going into the race. Is that I don't like big favorites who only have that one effort that's a lot better than everybody else, and then a bunch of other races that are good but don't tower over the field. So. I thought he was a little bit vulnerable in there. Thought, still thought he would run by at the top of the stretch. You know, the pace was faster than I thought it would be, but for the most part, I think it held together. 
Uh, there were a couple of, of, of good performances from back in the pack. I want to give a shout out to John with uh, Mr. Big News running a good third. Was not enough to get him out of the basement in our three-year-old contest, which we'll get to. But uh, still a, a, a good showing from him at 46 to 1. Honor AP ran a huge race, I thought, to be fourth in there. Uh, just kind of went sideways at the start. Was way, way back. Got wide on both turns. And still put, up, put in a pretty good run to be fourth. But Max Player ran an okay race to be fifth. Was, was finishing up okay in there after being way back early on. But the race was really about the top two horses in the showdown at the top of the stretch. And Authentic was really the forgotten horse. And we kind of dismissed him last week. Bill went way overboard saying he wouldn't even put him in the exactas. But uh, I didn't think he was he was a win candidate either, even though I expected the pace to hold together. And, you know, there was really no excuse for Tizzle. And it was you got to give full marks to Authentic for really digging in and turning him aside. This wasn't like he just got loose on the lead and was never confronted. He had a real chance to lose that race determined not to obviously a huge story is the the Baffert component what an interesting circuitous route he took to this derby seems to have a stranglehold on the race early in the season with charlatan and nadal and authentic who was probably the third string at that point charlatan and nadal obviously drop off due to injury at uncle chuck who seemed to be the kind of up-and-coming Baffert horse that was going to take their place he bombed in the travers so they had to drop him aside Cezanne, he looked like another potential derby starter didn't make it there actually had to scratch out of the pat day mile on saturday um and then thousand words flips in the paddock injuring jimmy barnes breaking his wrist some crazy quotes from jimmy barnes on on sunday about how he wasn't gonna say anything and then he pulled down his shirt and his hand was pointing the wrong way so he was like i better say something ended up watching the race on the way to the hospital got surgery so he sounds like he's doing all right but just what an interesting route that that baffert took to this derby he had seemingly you know, the race cornered in May, you know, even later in the summer, it seemed to have a really strong hand. And then he was down to one horse. Pretty much everyone had forgotten. And that horse gets it done for him. Huge weekend. We'll get to the Oaks. Toss it to Bill for his impressions on the Derby. Well, first, I'm not the only one wearing the dunce cap here. This was the good horse that nobody liked. I'm not talking about a 50 to one shot that everybody said he has no chance. If you go back and listen to our podcast or look at what everybody was saying, this is a horse that looked like a mile and a quarter was going to be impossible for him based on what he did in the Haskell. And so, you know, what happened from the Haskell where he was two, two and a half in front turning for home and almost got caught on the wire in a mile and eighth race by New York traffic to what transpired seven weeks later in the Kentucky Derby. And I think the credit goes to Baffert. And I, I wrote this afterwards. I mean, it's one thing to win the Kentucky Derby with horses like American Pharaoh and Justified. I mean, probably any trainer in the country could have won with them because they were superior horses. I think this really brought out the best in Baffert. He had seven weeks to figure out how to get this horse to go a mile and a quarter, and he did it. And, you know, again, uh, I don't think that I'm the only one that needs to, uh, you know, you know, have egg on my face right now. I mean, the whole, the whole world of handicappers and experts did not like this horse. So, you know, he was better than we thought. He was able to run a mile and a quarter when most people think he couldn't do it. And, you know, hats off to him. Kudos to the whole team and kudos to a good horse who was underrated. Yeah, and Bill, I will I will also wear the <laughs> hat, as it were. Um, or props. Because, because I was because I was, I think, the only one on the at the end of the show when we went through all the horses, and I was like, hey, what about this authentic horse? And we were all like, nah, he's never gonna do it. What does he know? He was gasping for air at the Haskell. And and so, you know, we're all kind of in the in the same boat. But yeah, it, it was nice to see you know, authentic, hold off everybody. Um, a couple of takeaways from, from the race on the jockey side for me. Number one is that Johnny Velasquez actually outrode everybody in that race, um, you know, coming in from all the way on the outside. And uh, he was patient. He waited for some of the speed to go. He made other jockeys make a decision first. And then he kind of, you know, went, uh, went on his own. And it was the third Kentucky Derby win for Johnny Velasquez and his 200th grade one victory. Um, so it couldn't be more fitting that he won his 200th in the Kentucky Derby, which I thought was was just really kind of cool from a from a numbers standpoint. Um, the other jockey that I want to highlight is I was watching very closely our, our own Paco Lopez in it. And midway through the, the beginning of the race, like in the first two furlongs, I was I actually uttered out loud because my wife was laughing at me. I said, what the hell is Paco doing? And you know, he, he was basically kind of riding the horse almost like it was a maiden 10 claimer at Monmouth, where he was trying to rush to the front and and get out in front of everybody and knocking people over on, you know, on the left and then, you know, kind of situating himself on the right. 
he did not look like he was of the caliber of the rest of the group, um, you know, compared to Johnny Velasquez and Saez and Mikey Smith and, and the rest of the group. But but no, listen, Paco's ridden horses and ridden winners for us. But I think it's usually when, you know, when, when you have a good horse, Paco is great on the front end. When you get to this stage, whether it's the World Series in baseball or the Super Bowl in football or the Kentucky Derby at, at Churchill Downs, you have to up your game. And some people can do it like a big money Mike. That's why he's, Mike Smith's called that. And some people, you know, need extra seasoning and need to do it a couple of times before they can get to that level. And that's that's what my takeaway was from Paco. And again, my friends own part of New York traffic. So I was very focused on, you know, trying to root Cash is King and and LC Racing and, and those guys home because it would be a great story and they're good people in the business. And I want, you know, I want good things for for Chuck and, and uh, you know, uh, Chuck Zachney and, and Glenn Bennett and, and their teams. So I was very focused on that gray horse. But man, he he did not look like he he being Paco did not look like he deserved to kind of be in that same kind of group as as those riders. And I know part of the reason why is simply because a lot of jockeys opted not to go to Kentucky this weekend. So, you know, I, I don't blame Paco for taking the shot and for doing it. Um, but I just don't think that he did a great job in that race. Um, and that was my third takeaway. OK, my fourth takeaway in the race. And I'll let Al have the have the floor is that, um, you know, as a lot of people on, on social media were talking about, geez, it was the second or third fastest Kentucky Derby um, ever. Well, you know, again, I want to pump the brakes on that a little bit, because while the timing of it and Bill, you can jump in on, on stop on timing and, and whether or not it was right or not. Um, but on the timing of it, he did finish in, in two minutes and three fifths. He went home the last quarter mile in 25 and three. So he was he was kind of dogged at the, at the end. Um, and yeah, it was the second or third. I don't remember the fastest Kentucky Derby in, in modern history. Um, but these horses are also much, much further along into their three year old years. Um, you know, obviously all the other derbies are in May and when some of the horses aren't even 36 months old yet and they're racing versus now their development from, you know, May of their two or the three year old year, excuse me, until September of their three year old year is huge. It's a big, big difference. So that part didn't surprise me that the time was so fast and so close to a record. Um, but the fact that they went home in 24 and four and then 25 and three for the last quarter mile, that actually did surprise me. Take it away, Al. I guess I, uh, I'm not surprised. I mean, you could turn that argument upside down and say after going a half mile in 46 and two or three, that 25 and three come home time and, and two minutes and change for a mile and a quarter a distance that we obviously had our question marks. And I think that's probably something that you could turn into a positive for him. So I was against authentic. I have him in the contest. Um, in full disclosure, I would have, had Maxfield been available for our draft, I would have gone with Maxfield. And John, I think you were a Maxfield fan. And I'll trade you. Fan. You want to trade? I'm into trades. Um, so I, I tried to be authentic out of the top two as well. I used Honor AP and Tis the Law. I saw them as, as the only two horses that could win the race um, because I thought the pace would be genuine. And I also think what happened with Thousand Words had some material effect on the outcome. That I don't. I don't think I'm not a giant thousand words fan. Um, he would have added to the pace, I think, from down uh, from from where he was starting. And either I, I don't know that he's that he was faster than than authentic, and that authentic might not have beat him to the first turn. He could have been with the pace and maybe hung authentic out another path heading into that first turn, making his life just slightly more difficult. But I think it's possible as well that. Um, the track, which played speedy all weekend and played kind of speed and speed that was being set in the two path or three path, not at the rail. Um, I think it, the argument could be made that the track might have helped him um, a little bit. You know, Tisla, I think Tisla got probably ahead or neck ahead of, of Authentic at the 316s. And then, you know, Joe, like you, you said, from there, he really didn't have an excuse. So, um, so hands off to Authentic. As an Honor AP fan, that was um, that was a difficult watch um, to see what happened out of the gate, whether you believe that that was an intentional move by Paco uh, or not. And I haven't, I guess I haven't decided yet. I'd be interested what you guys think. Um, he definitely took a right turn. Now, I don't know if that impacted Mike Smith 
or honor AP and, and uh, left him flat footed. Mike said after the race that honor AP did not get over the track. I mean, here's a horse that was beaten five lengths in fourth, covering 49 feet more than authentic and didn't get over the track. So my pocket, but my pocketbook hurts for that one um, because I threw all of them underneath Tizla and Honor AP in, in the uh, in the triple. So, um, but listen, great to have a Derby. Great call by uh, by Travis Stone, and uh, you know Derby's in the books. And great job by Baffert. I agree with you, Bob. I think uh, Bill, Bob, I Bill, Bob. Um, you know Baffert pulled. Uh, a Mandela or a Ron McAnally and work this horse six and seven and a mile of all, of all things. And it worked. So hats off. Yeah. I mentioned that last week when we were talking about him, that it kind of seemed like he wasn't hundred percent convinced that the horse could go a mile and a quarter with the way he was working them. But because he knew what he was doing because it didn't seem like that it was, it was a problem for him in the stretch. I just, in general, I hate the, he didn't handle the track excuse. Like it just, it's just so easy. And it's just the jockey can just say it. And there's, there's no like empirical proof of it whatsoever. I get it. If the horse like got beat 30 lengths or whatever, and you say they hated the track or sloppy or something, but horse ran as well as tis the law and not our AP did. I don't want to hear about how they didn't like the track. All right. So what looked like a runaway victory for me in the three-year-old fantasy contest just a couple of weeks ago is now neck and neck. Because Al, who didn't like Authentic going in the Derby, nevertheless gets the 300 points for him and got the 100 from the Haskell. So you better start liking him real soon, Al. Right. So, here's, 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 so here's where we are. So I, I got uh, 120 for Tisla running second. So I'm at 530 points right now. Al got 300 for Authentic. He's at 528. So two points difference. Uh, Brian's been left behind a little bit. He's, he's at 315. Bill's got 85 still. And John. Just couldn't quite get out of the toilet. Got 60 points for the big run from Mr. Big News, but it's still five points behind Bill in last place. Uh, so we have one more race on the schedule for the contest, which is the Preakness, October 3rd. 150 points to the winner, 60 to second, 30 to third, 15 to fourth. I feel reasonably good if Tissa Law and Art Collector both make it there, um, but obviously anything can happen. But it's good. It's good. To, it's good to see somebody. Up in my level, Al. Finally, during this whole contest. So, we'll, uh, unless you guys have any more more Derby thoughts, I'm happy to move on to the Oaks, which was a fascinating race in its own uh, right as well. Gamine, I thought was honestly the biggest disappointment of the entire weekend because of the pace that she got away with. Now, maybe she was going too slow. There are certain speed horses when you know they're they they go 48 or 112 or whatever. They for some reason they just they're not into it the way they are when they go 46, 109, try to bottom out the field. But she was she was supposed to win that race. And, you know, no no disrespect to She Dares the Devil, I thought, you know, I, this is after the race. This is a post-race opinion. But I thought she was an overlay at, at 14 to 1. I, you know, I thought there were, like, there were two second-tier contenders, her and Donna Veloce. Of course, I went with Donna Veloce, who stunk. Um, but she, had, she, she ran great. So did, so did Swiss Skydiver. Uh, but Gamin, I thought was, was a super disappointment and it kind of like, it kind of ties into the, the, the nature of the, the year for Baffert. He had that one final disappointment with Gamin, who I'm sure he was expecting much better out of. And, uh, you know, she didn't get the job done. Didn't really come close. Didn't, didn't switch leads until like the eighth pole. So I thought that was, she's, she's a little nuts. I think she's, she's always tugging one way or the other and just, I don't know. She's. She's super talented, obviously. If she, you can get her out on the lead in a one-turn race, she's brilliant. Probably, I don't know, may, may go favorite in the Philly and Mare Sprint if that's where she ends up. But uh, she's she, she's not quite a finished product, and, and I don't know if, if she'll ever be. And she's just really disappointed over the over the weekend. Um, some other other really good performances we'll get to, but I just wanted to get some quick thoughts from you guys on the Oaks. Well, Joe, you don't want to spend another ten minutes talking about Paco Lopez. That's I didn't have that on the rundown. Maybe okay. I, should, I should factor in a Paco Lopez segment every week for John. Yeah, so did he ride in the Oaks? I don't think he had a, a mount. Um, I agree with pretty much everything you said about the Oaks, but I was extremely disappointed uh, just by the whole race. And you know, I was the guy, I got into it because I was doing the road to the Oaks with the TDN, so I was following these horses all along. 
And I thought this had a chance to be the most scintillating race we've seen in a long time between two superstars. And, you know, I'm not taking anything away from She Dares the Devil. Uh, she ran great. She won the race. But, you know, her a victory but for her just wasn't the script we were looking for in the storylines. So a couple things to talk about. First of all, the the reason why she won was probably Brad Cox. I mean, this guy was just insanely hot over this weekend. His horses, I mean, Bo Recall beats newspaper of record. That's not supposed to happen either. His horse is just running through their skin. And, you know, he's good with everything, but with three-year-old fillies, he's just outstanding. Um, on Gamine, I think we found out that she doesn't want to go a mile and eight. Uh, you know, could she have won? Yes. Uh, was she disappointing? Yes. Did she run her best race? No. But, you know, there was that whole buildup uh, just like, you know, Authentic can't go a mile and a quarter. We were wrong. A lot of people said Gamine really doesn't want to go a mile and eighth. And people that are saying that were technically right. Now, she doesn't want to go the distance. You're right. I think the Breeders Cup Philly Mayor Sprint will be where she'll wind up and she'll be very, very tough there. But I still can't figure out how uh, She Dares the Devil beat Swiss Skydiver, uh, who we knew could go the distance. She ran a race. You know, it's just one of those things you shrug your shoulders and move on. But, you know, just, just because... Not to knock any horse, knock she dares a devil, just because I was so up for that race. It just kind of went over the, you know, all right, you know, why did this happen? Let's turn the page. Maybe the Derby will be uh, fun tomorrow. And maybe Paco Lopez will impede 17 horses that we can talk about. It. Yeah. And, and you have to, again, give credit to she dares a devil coming in from the Indiana Oaks, you know, which she crushed the field there and including Baroness and, and a couple of the horses that, that ended up running in the Kentucky Oaks. Um, and then, you know, Brad Cox did a great job of, of getting her ready and, and getting her to peak um, in a lifetime best buyer number. She went from an 80, 83 in uh, an allowance race at Churchill to an 86 buyer at the Indiana Oaks and then a 101 to win the Kentucky Oaks, which is a huge jump. But credit to him for getting the Philly to that point. Um, Gamin in watching her run reminds me of a, like Bellafina, where she's just a really top athlete, you know, bigger, stronger than the rest of the group but she just can't get that extra eighth of a mile and maybe better off turning back um, to run in the Breeders' Cup, uh, you know, sprint, like you mentioned, Bill, or some of the big grade one sprints, um, you know, for fillies that are out in California later on. Because, I mean, Bellafina has, has carved out a nice career making $1.6, $1.7 million, um, you know, running in a lot of those seven eighths and, and one turn mile, six for all kind of races. So the, the future is still bright, I think, for a Gamine. But um, I was also equally impressed that, of course, this happens in, in the in the business, you know, Daredevil, um, who is not heard of for a while and then and then, you know, gets gets kind of you know sent off. Now he's got horses that finish one, two in the Kentucky Oaks, um, which is just incredible. If you think about it, that a stallion um, it actually has horses that finish first and second in the Oaks in any year, let alone in a crazy year like this. So um, overall, yeah, it was disappointing. Gamine didn't run well. You have to take your hat off to She Dares the Devil. And Swiss Skydiver, you know, man, that filly, she just runs hard every single race, no matter where they run her, no matter what distance they run her against boys, girls, you know, shorter, longer, a mile and a quarter, a mile and an eighth, um, you know, on the East Coast, West Coast, and everywhere in between. And, you know, to run second in the Oaks, you shouldn't hang your hat, uh, hang your head, excuse me, um, because that's still a really, really outstanding finish. Is it the finish that McPeak and his team wanted her to, to you know, to end up? No, but she's still going to have a lot of racing left uh, in her between now and the end of the year and uh, and still have a shot at, at uh, ringing the bell, you know, albeit a tougher ass against older mares, but in the uh, in the handicap division there. Yeah, let's give um, let's give credit to Brad Cox It's two oaks in three years with um, with Monomal Girl two years ago. Um and let's also not forget that Brad Cox lost what might have been um, a top Oaks contender in Taras earlier this year to a tragic, uh, to a tragic injury. So uh, Bonnie South could have represented the stable for Judmont. She kind of picked up the torch for Judmont uh, after Taraz's passing, but um, she didn't make the Oaks. So this is a great training job. She's a filly. I couldn't feel I agreed entirely with your analysis in, in the Oaks preview. I, I didn't see her bridging the gap. I mean, she had 15 points, if, if not more than that, to make up on, on Gamine and, and Swiss Skydiver. Um, I thought speech made sense as, as an alternative and, and she kind of got left and, and then never really picked up her feet either. So um, I think Gamine is definitely um, a turn back candidate. And um, in that vein, I think the Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Sprint could be one of the races of Breeders' Cup weekend with her. 
um, Serengeti Empress, could you imagine those two ding-donging it on the front end, um, tossing a little me and mischief, and then for me, tossing Bell's the one. I, I think that's going to be one of the races of, of uh, the first weekend of November. So, uh, yeah, a bit disappointing, a bit anticlimactic in the uh, in the Oaks, but it, you know, sometimes those are the better stories. And, and Alan, you, you mentioned, you know, Bell's the one, and I know you have a personal connection with, with the trainer there, but I have to admit that I was rooting hard for Serengeti Empress to, to get up there. Um, and, and no offense to, to, to Neil, who's the trainer of, of, of Bell's the one, but man, I was, I was yelling, screaming, and, and I have no skin in the game on, on that race whatsoever, but what a great race that ended up being the, the Derby city distaff, um, between those two top, top Phillies, Bell's the one and Serengeti Empress. And I gotta say, like, I would take Serengeti Empress over Gamina in a head to head because the fractions that she puts up are just crazy to be running 43 and three halves and still and have something away. left. And went away for six furlongs too, Joe. It was amazing. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So she's, I, I would take her over Gamina. I think Gamine, you know, she's used to more running like 22, 45. That's not going to cut it against Serengeti Empress. She's, she's a beast going one turn for sure. So it wasn't just the Derby and the Oaks. There were a lot of performances that were worth mentioning over the weekend, Labor Day weekend, really the uh, the close of the of the summer racing season, as well as the summer season in general. It's not just racing, but uh, we'll go. I'll go through the the Derby and Oaks Day undercard races that I think are worth mentioning. Bottom white girl, obviously, we got to see whether uh, John thinks she's back or not. The ninety seven buyer was it wasn't wasn't the greatest La Troyan I've ever seen. Kind of disappointing efforts from Vexatious and uh, and Horologist. Uh, Digital Age had a big win in the uh, in the turf class. I think I know Al's a fan of his. Uh, Bill mentioned Bo Recall. Um, otherwise, Sharing, I'm so great to see Sharing back. She's a really cool horse. She's not, you know, she's not, not not a generational talent in terms of speed figures yet, but just to go and run as well as she did at Royal Ascot, where it was a race where it, you want to talk about a horse that didn't get get over the track. I thought she looked super uncomfortable in the coronation and still ran a good second to Alpine Star, who got that perfect trip. Came back, won the Edgewood on Friday at Churchill. So that was super exciting for to see her. I was she was a rising star that I made, so I have that kind of a little bit of a connection to her as well. The racing at Saratoga, Jackie's Warrior in the in the hopeful was just super dominant. Stopped the clock in one twenty one and change. I mean, track at Saratoga has been playing very fast the last couple of weeks, like faster than I've ever seen it play. But still, one twenty one is real running, no matter how fast the track is. Uh, Vquist the day before. In the spin away, um, I thought it was interesting. Princess Nora then won the uh, the uh, Del Mar debutante. She was crazy impressive on Sunday. I thought it was interesting that uh, first crop sires swept the two uh, juvenile Philly grade ones with Nyquist in the spin away, and then not this time in the Del Mar debutante. Princess Nora, I think, is interesting where she only got a 79 buyer, but she really hasn't been allowed to run in either of her two races, like the first race especially. She was just like never really was asked to run, did everything on her own. And then Sunday did, you know, was asked a little bit, but, you know, for the most of the final film, she was wrapped up on. So it'll be interesting to see how good she is when she faces a little better competition. Um, if, uh, a couple of interesting turf performances I wanted to mention. Flavius in the, uh, the tourist mile yesterday at Kentucky Downs had a big late punch for Chad Brown and Judge Mont, Judd Mont got a 103 buyer. And then I wanted to mention, I mentioned him before in the Keeneland bit, but analyze it who we hadn't seen since he ran in the 2018 Breeders' Cup Mile. I was always trying to figure out where he was. Came back in the Red Bank Stakes. Our headquarters are in Red Bank at TDN, so Alice always made the joke that we should pre- we should present the trophy, which I think uh, would be great in a normal year. Um, but, yes, so it was good to see him back. He got 100 buyer. Obviously not a great, not a great field, still a great three, but uh, good to see him back, and he could be an interesting turf miler going forward. But... Those are just some of the performances that I that caught my eye this weekend. Obviously, the, the juveniles, other than the Derby and the Oaks, were the big story. Uh, I wonder if there's anything else that caught you guys' eye or anything I, that I said that you want to follow up on. Basically, I'm just going to jump in on on Monomoy Girl because I thought that was a really impressive race um, in the La Trail you know, the Grade One in a in a deep deep field. And and you know, it's nice. It's really good to see the Philly back. Um, I know, I know you guys poke fun at me about the, the back meter and everything like that, but the bottom line is that, that I never had anything against the Philly. Um, you know, it, it was, it was just that, that, that silliness of, of sending the, uh, the pressure of these out. But that being said, the Philly herself has come back into dominant form and it looks like that she's really getting into, 
Uh, she got the rust off the first race. She won, you know, the second race impressively, and then the La Trienne against a deeper field and, and a real competition. Um, she just put them away. So she is trending, po- excuse me, trending positive towards the uh, towards the Breeders' Cup. Um, this is no fun. I wanted I wanted it to keep I wanted the feud to keep going until we got a bare knuckle boxing match between you and uh, Brandon. I have I have no ill will towards the owners of the trainer of the horse or the horse for that matter. So you know that being said, um, the the Euros came out in strong force um, this weekend at, at you know at, at Churchill and 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 really anywhere where there was a turf race, um, there were Euros that were winning it. Digital, digital age you mentioned. Rock Emperor ran third, and and Sacred Life ran fourth in the uh, in the Bourbon Turf Grade One, and then there was another race I can't remember right now, but um, the first three horses won, uh, finished one, two, three, and a Grade Two as well, um, and they were all from Europe. So it's interesting to see them come here and continue to to, uh, to dominate the fields, especially on the turf races. Um, you know, Joe, I think you did a great job mentioning two first year stallions, not this time in Nyquist, and how. Their graduates, uh, you know, or, or their, their progeny are, are graduating in a big way. Um, you know, I give a lot of credit to Bequist, you know, who won just well in hand um, by nine and a half, ten lengths in, in the spinaway. That was an impressive race. And it looks like that, you know, she's continuing to progress and, and may be able to handle a little bit further ground. Um, but overall, I thought it was just a great weekend of racing. And I was glued to the TV for most of the weekend with regard to watching all of these graded races. And this is what we've been starving for. You know, this is what we were clamoring for in March, April, May, um, you know, and, and just begging for some of these races to come together. And now the fields are really tight. They're really running well. And these horses are, uh, you know, the top horses are, are rising to the, t- you know, to the cream of the crop and the top of the, uh, their respective, uh, you know, divisions. So I'm excited about it. I know last week I was like a kid in the candy store, you know, bouncing off the walls in anticipation of this weekend. And overall, you know, I thought that the races were very good. Um, I was also, you know, always in the back of my mind these days, I'm always thinking, okay, please don't have a national televised breakdown. And I think that all of the protocols that have gone into place for safety for the animals and, um, and making sure the athletes are sound, um, you know, overall was really, really good. So again, you know, we don't talk about that enough, except when it's a bad thing. Um, but it was just great to see that everyone started and finished, except for at Kentucky Downs, where a couple of horses didn't get the start. But um, but that that's uh, that, that's neither here nor there because Kentucky Downs actually did the right thing. I don't know if you guys saw this, but they had a race where two of the horses didn't you know, the gates didn't open, um, so they ended up giving everybody five thousand dollars. Everyone who participated in the race five thousand dollars for starting, um, and they gave jockey fees. I think of five hundred as well. So. Uh, kudos to uh, Kentucky Downs, you know, for for that meet and and for that uh, for that feat, I should say. They always do everything right. They they, they do things they right. Do. They yeah. really really do. And we're we're actually running another miracle there this weekend um, coming up in in a, in a big. I mean, every every stake race there is a big race money wise. Um, but that being said, you know, if, if they did the absolute right thing because can you imagine if that happened at a different racetrack where you know the gate didn't open for for two of the horses they would have said oh well those horses were non competitors and therefore uh, you'll get your wagers back but what about for the owners and the jockeys and the trainers so again uh, you know congratulations to Kentucky Downs for handling that and getting in front of it before it uh, you know before it became an issue sorry al go ahead oh that's cool um just in a generic sense um i run this list in in the paper every um usually every tuesday but today because of the holiday racing but um if you look at our the list of new stakes winners for sires, you'll see like five sons of Giants Causeway sired winners this week, including freshman Brody's Cause and not this time. So I think that's a good um, good sign for a horse that some have always questioned whether he's going to be a, a sire of sires, but um, and Brody's Cause and, and not this time um, could sort of fly that flag. And then um, Uncle Mo has, obviously he's a fairly young a stallion. He's got a few first crop sires out there, but um, all in the last week, Laband, Outwork, and Nyquist all had stakes winners. And and um, in the same vein, real promising start for um, for him as a uh, as a sire of sires. So just wanted to add that in. And, and now L- Loban, I think if I remember correctly, his his horse that won a stake race, it was, even though it was a New York Stallion, it was an open stake race, right? It wasn't like it was a New York bred race. This horse won the PG Johnson. Right. On right, the turf. Off the, off oh, it was the turf, off the right. turf, but she looked really good. She got an 81 buyer for Ken McPeak. Uh, so, yeah, I was, we were, we talked last year about the star-studded freshman class that we had last year, freshman sires. 
this year's looking pretty good too so far. You know, with not this time, Mike Quist, you got a handful of other stallions that are off to good starts, like Upstart, At Work, like Al mentioned. So I think don't sleep on this year's freshman class as well. I think they might they may turn out to be a pretty good class. Um, so yeah, and just to to jump back to the Kentucky Downs thing real quick, because somebody saw some people complaining that the race was declared no contest because. I, I get it. Like if you had the, the try or whatever in that race, like you feel like you're kind of screwed, but you have to think that the two horses who didn't get in the gate would affect the race in some way, whether it's the pace, whether it's traffic, like you just, you can't call that, you can't call that the race if it didn't have all the horses in the gate. So it sucks if you, you got, you feel like you got screwed out of a, a winning bet there, but that that's the right call to make in, in every case. And I think there, so yeah, good job at Kentucky Downs. Not good job getting them in the gate, but everything that happened after that, the good job by them. They do they they do right by people. And I think that's that's why they, they have such a popular made addition to the big purses, obviously. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. So West Point closed the book on one Kentucky Derby with winning impression on Saturday and then their dreams danced on to 2021. In the run for the roses with a little nudge from Arabian Prince, two-year-old Colt. He began his career, career with a sharp win at Churchill Downs last Wednesday, also for trainer Dallas Stewart. Uh, Arabian Prince was a yearling purchase last year, and uh, they're on the prowl again. Came in September, as we've spoken about, starting this Sunday. Um, and that's the sale where they really kind of made their bones with Decorated Invader, Rig Weekend, Untamed Domain, Hard Not to Love, Giza Goddess, Caressa, Just Whistle, Whistle Dixie, and Burn. So... Uh, they've definitely cleaned up at that sale in the past and figured to do so again. So um, best of luck in the 2021 Derby. We'll be keeping an eye on the on the two-year-olds for West Point. And best of luck at the sale, guys. So we have a little bit of news this morning. Um, it's been a pretty light news week, and as, aside from the, the Derby and the Oaks. But uh, Ahmed Zayat has reportedly filed for bankruptcy. Um, this was reported by, T, by T.D. Thornton in the TDN. Um, this was kind of an ongoing story with him that he's had these liabilities to trainers all across the industry had to liquidate a lot of horses last year. Um, just a guy that is kind of no- notorious for, for not paying his bills. And this is kind of coming home to roost for him right now. And it's just, it's a major fall from grace for me. That's, that's, that's my impression on it. You know, I remember back in, I think maybe it was like 2005, 2006, somewhere in the mid two thousands. And he just burst onto the scene at Saratoga at a bunch of horses with Bill Mott, and I kept seeing these light blue silks with the Z's on them winning every race and so many two-year-old races. There was one summer at Saratoga where he just killed it. And I was like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Lo and behold, a couple of years later, he ends up with American Pharaoh um, winning, winning the first Triple Crown in 37 years. You would think that that would set you up for life to have the first Triple Crown winner in 37 years, have a massive stud deal for him. Um, but obviously, that, that, that wasn't the case. It's sad, honestly, because I think overall, I mean, I don't know I'm at Zayat or any of the Zayats at all, but it seemed like, you know, their heart was in the right place in terms of, you know, having the horses, having the horses run, you know, investing in the business. I didn't think that he seemed like an outwardly bad guy or they seemed like an outwardly bad family. They seemed to, you know, really care about the sport and be passionate about it. So it sucks. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to like take any pleasure in somebody going belly up like that, but it's it's a crazy story to have the first Triple Crown winner. 37 years and then five years later you're filing for bankruptcy i mean there's a there's a lot more in the story a lot more details about who he owes money specifically to but it's a sad story man i just that's that's my main takeaway yeah i mean joe you're right i mean the first thing you think of this is not a guy who wasn't winning any races or was not making any money Uh, you know when you take the earnings of american pharaoh plus the stud deal 
you know, what does that add up to? How many millions and millions of dollars? And still this happens. And, you know, none of this is any sort of surprise. I mean, everybody knew the financial problems he was having. Uh, it was well uh, documented with the legal proceedings from that uh, investment banking group that had lent him money. But you look at this, and, and this is right out of TD's story. The thing that really jumps off the page is the trainers who are left holding the bag for money that he owes. And I just see uh, Bob Baffert, 227000 Brad Cox, 194000 Richard Baltus, 316000 Rudy Rodriguez, 394000 Todd Fletcher, 125. Those are all the, the debts that he is uh, owed to these trainers. And, you know, most of these guys are doing very well in life uh, financially, but still, I mean, to get stiffed out of 200,000 bucks thing to, for anybody. And, um, you know, I mean, guess they knew what they were getting into was I reputation. So I don't know how much you feel sorry for him, but nonetheless, I mean, that's a tough pill to swallow. And, you know, I, I John Green is the expert on, on this sort of thing so far as finances and taxes and maybe bankruptcy and everything. So maybe he can uh, explain that. But, you know, they'll see pennies on the dollar. And, and uh, you know, that, that's got to be something for every single one of those trainers. It's got to be a pretty, uh, leave a pretty bad taste in their mouth. Yeah. And, and Bill, you're, you're right. I mean, TD Thornton does a great job of identifying all the people that are, you know, or the prominent people, I should say, that are owed money in the 140 something page legal proceeding. Um, so, you know, we give him credit for, for going through and coming up with, with the information. But I feel bad, you know, not only for the trainers, but also for some of these businesses. I mean, Brookledge is owed $164,000. Tiger Davidson and some of the major, um, you know, vet clinics um, in the country are each owed over $200,000. So, you know, it, it does make an impact from a competitive, you know, balance standpoint. You say, all right, well, why is he winning all these races? He's got the top trainers. He's got the, you know, the, the best bloodstock, uh, you know, agents out there and, and some really good horse flesh. But also, if you're not paying your bills, you have a competitive advantage over people who are paying their bills and can't buy the next horse or, you know, or have an opportunity to, to, to uh, you know, to, to buy a couple of horses more and, and kind of get their inventory going. So it, it's not a great situation. You know, again, we can't take pleasure in this at all because um, it, it just it, it's somebody's shortcomings that are just, you know, now open for business that, that everyone can see all the information on. It's, it's not a great look for the industry because here was somebody that is recently as on Saturday, um, you know, when, when they did the, a piece on American Pharaoh, they did a uh, NBC, I don't know if you saw, did a wonderful job on, on, you know, following American Pharaoh and their falls as they, as they came old enough to run and then ultimately, you know, run in the Breeders' Cup races. And, and Ahmed and his son, Justin, were front and center on that, uh, you know, on that documentary. Um, and they were very polished and they did a great job and they had some great answers and you could feel their genuineness of how much they love the horse and how much they love the sport. So it, it is sad that a prominent group like the Zaya family um, is now, you know, in this kind of a situation, but I, you know, I feel bad for the vendors more, more, more so than, than I do for the family. And John, I think we got to make mention that's a bad job by NBC. And they put out this warm and fuzzy story about Ahmed Zayat and uh, granted, this latest bankruptcy thing didn't come out till afterwards. But, you know, how do you write, tell that story without going into the details of the, you know, unseemly or messy side of everything that's been going on? And, you know, I know that it's not meant to be 60 minutes and a hard hitting piece and everything. But, you know, for racing insiders to know the backstory of everything that's going on. And, you know, that is really ignored in this piece by NBC. I, I think, you know, look, they do a really good job of their horse racing coverage as a whole. But I thought this feature, you know, lacking any discussion of something that's very pertinent uh, part of the American Pharaoh story definitely is a bad job by them. You know, in addition to um, to American Pharaoh, let's not forget that Zayat's raced the likes of um, his sire, Pioneer of the Nile, um, who's unfortunately passed away since, but uh, Painter. And, and there's that whole story with Painter and, and, um, and the founder and over, overcoming that, uh, Bodie Meister. And then he's had several good... Um, Good race fillies, Jay Z Warrior and um, Hard Ashley, and 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 so those were valuable assets at, at, as well at, at a time. So, yeah, I mean, it really is you know for a high class operation, um, you know, it really is sad to see its demise. You know, it's it's one of those things where I, I agree that it doesn't reflect well on racing that he was able to run up these debts with so many different people, despite his reputation for not paying bills. And it's just, there's, there's so much in the industry where as long as the money keeps churning in, 
people don't really care where, where it comes from. Like I kind of, I don't know. I think of Phoenix Thoroughbreds a little bit, you know, there was that big scandal with them and supposedly allegedly, you know, there was a, it was a, there was a sham cryptocurrency that was started by the owner of, of Phoenix Thoroughbreds. And it seemed for a little bit like, okay, well that was going to be it for them and the business. And now they're, you know, winning grade one races and running all over the place and have all these like really good looking horses. I mean, maybe that they're, you know, once that gets completely adjudicated, it'll be different, but there's too much in racing where, you know, as long as people are spending money, you don't care where it comes from. You don't care where it's borrowed from. You don't care where it's, you know, allegedly stolen from. It's, I don't know. I get that we need owners, but it's just for Zayat to be able to rack up six figures in debt with so many different people. It's like, how was, how was this not nipped in the bud earlier on by somebody somewhere? And uh, yeah, so that's, we got to do a better job of that. That's uh, that's the the weekly, we have to do a better job corner right there for, for racing. Uh, can't be a show without it. Joining the West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. Group guest of the week is sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. Our Green Group guest of the week this week is the founder of My Race Horse, whose silks were carried to the winner's circle in Saturday's Kentucky Derby by Authentic, Michael Behrens. Thank you for joining us. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks. <laughs> that sounded good, though. You can say that yeah. if you want. <laughs> That's a, I can't ask for a better intro than that. Um, so, all right. So let's, let's start with the basics. Um, can you tell us the genesis and the inspiration for creating my racehorse? And then I guess kind of the cliff notes version of how you saw enough proof of concept to go after a big horse like authentic. Yeah, no, great question. So uh, like I am not from the, the racing world. Um, I'm, I've been in ad tech and marketing my whole career uh, growing up in Southern California San Anita was like 15 uh, minutes away, and that's where we went to decompress after crazy stressful weeks, you know, go out with the, the friends, have a couple of drinks, maybe a burger, and, and bet a few races. And I just loved it as a sport, as a form of entertainment, um, but then professionally was running an ad agency, eventually worked in some e-commerce for a company called Casper that sold mattresses in a box. I was a CMO over there, but always very intrigued about kind of what drives the sport, how we can get more fan engagement. Uh, started kind of looking around, talking to people, and just came up with this concept that people who really were energized, really excited about our sport, were those that had some part, some way, had some kind of interest in ownership, either through friends or a partnership, whatever it may be. And I just, I just felt like that was like where the where we could scale, we could get trial, we could get kind of mass uh, adoption to appreciate the sport. And uh, I kind of started meeting some people and. And uh, people started telling me a little bit about the, maybe some of the challenges that we would face in, in, in doing an idea like that. So we uh, we started in California and we got the state of California to grant us a permit to do it only there uh, under like a pilot program. And it went really well. And that was kind of the genesis that got us excited. Um, we saw the, the, the amount of people who were enjoying the product that were signed up. Um, and kind of then we just then we went national just July of last year. That was it. So it's it's been a short window that we've actually been out of our pilot and been live. Hey, Michael, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. And let's continue with that story about the history of MyRacehorse.com, et cetera. Obviously, a big part of your success has been Spendthrift Farms. Many of your horses, I believe it's about 50 percent, have some involvement with Spendthrift. Obviously, Authentic was a Spendthrift horse. So how did that relationship with Spendthrift and Wayne Hughes come to be? Yeah, so um, when I when I wrote the uh, the original business plan for this, uh, I looked at the industry to tr try to figure out who had the personality, the DNA, uh, and B. Wayne Hughes with his success in business uh, and his innovation with breeding 
I just loved his disruptive nature. Um, I actually used to do marketing for Public Storage, one of his companies. And so when the business kind of came to fruition, I basically called up Spendthrift and talked to Ned and said, can I have a meeting with B. Wayne Hughes? And he said, nope, but you can meet with me. Uh, so I came out and I, I kind of took him through the idea. And uh, the next day, Mr. Hughes called me back in and we started talking and he just loved it. He, was, he wants the sport to continue to thrive and grow, loved the concept. And we started partnering a couple of deals and that, that relationship has only gotten stronger and stronger over time. And, and now, you know, Mr. Hughes has come in as, as, as one of our partners. Uh, so our relationship with Spendthrift is vital. Our relationship with Mr. Hughes has been critical. Yeah, and Michael, it, it's Jonathan Green. Uh, welcome to the industry in a big way with, with the Kentucky Derby win. That's fantastic. Um, you know, we, we try to help out also here on the East Coast with um, encouraging people to be in the business, you know, through the Empire Racing Club and, and some other organizations like that. You've been successful in getting over 4,000 investors just in, uh, in the Kentucky Derby winner alone. Um, at, at what point in time do you feel like you're going to hit critical mass where, uh, where it's just going to be so many people involved and, and that's a good problem to have, but so many people getting involved in the industry. And, and at that point, do you step up and buy more expensive horses or do you kind of keep with, with the current business plan that you have? Yeah, great question. So kind of a couple things to unpack there. Um, I think, and actually, just for clarification, I have I was quoted in the press conference of, of saying it was forty six hundred because when I got to the track that morning, I saw the cap tables at forty five. I saw a lot of people buying in. Uh, the official was five thousand three hundred and fourteen by post time. We actually had to shut ten people off while they were in the gate. Um, but anyways, so that was uh, authentic as five thousand three hundred fourteen unique, unique unique owners, and I think we're. You know, we're really getting very close to that point of critical mass, uh, the viral coefficient, the network effects are starting to take over. And we're seeing real scale happen because you have so many brand ambassadors. I mean, there's so much excitement that's going on. And think about 5,314 people for one horse, and they all have their own social networks. And they were all posting their winner circle pictures. They were posting their, their, their videos. And we obsess internally about a concept called viral coefficient which is how do we make this product where it gets into social networks and it kind of goes into family and friends that we would never see, right? We're not part of their networks. We're not on their Facebook groups. And that's exactly what happened. And then the halo that we saw from the last couple of days, you can only imagine, but we have been seeing it for a while because we penetrated so many households because it's so easy to spread the word. So we're getting very close. We're having, um, it doesn't seem like there's anything that's slowing down. There's no deceleration to our growth rate. It's, it's actually, exponentially growing. So it's not like there was a bunch of early adopters that said, Hey, I've always wanted to do this and you know, let's check it off the list and we're done. It's the opposite uh, opposite is more credibility is being established partnerships with, you know, B Wayne Hughes and Spendthrift don't hurt when the Kentucky Derby doesn't hurt. Um, but you're really seeing that viral coefficient, that halo take off. And I think we've spent actually the last 40 hours talking so much about your question, which is like, we have a major responsibility now, to say this industry is going to have 100,000 micro share owners before we, we know it, right? If you just look at the directory, the U.S. is now going to have 100,000. It's inevitable. Um, and we have a responsibility to be a steward of that, to figure out how we navigate with the tracks and with the sales auctions. And, and every part of this industry now has to deal with the fact that a brand new player that brings in a lot of capital, which is the fan base, is now here and they're here in a big way. And they're going to have an impact in all aspects of this business. Hey, Michael, <clears throat> Alan Carrasso, thanks for thanks for being here. Uh, I'm curious, just what is the goal of my racehorse? Hey, different um, kind of theories floating around social media, and I'm sure you saw some of the, the uproar and the back and forth. But what is your intention? Is is your intention to try to grow thoroughbred ownership? You just want people to pay a couple of hundred dollars and and have the, the right to claim that, that they own a piece of a Kentucky Derby winner. What's, what, what do you see as the objective? Um, I mean, for us, our idea what is, was to give people the thrills and the excitement of uh, ownership without obviously the financial you know, burdens that, that normally come with it, right? So we, we made the minimum super low. Um, to, you know, the, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is how many people come in in a much more significant way. How many people have... 10 horses, how many got built 15 horses, how many people on average will spend four or 5,000 or 10,000 per horse. 
the idea was just to keep the minimums low and allow you to come in what makes you feel good, do it in a transparent world in, in a way. So all of our disclosures, all of our documentation is there. And I felt I sold my last company, right? So just give you a little context. And I wanted to come into ownership. And what I was turned off by was how opaque it was, right? Like I couldn't understand exactly what I was paying for, what was being bundled, what wasn't being unbundled. There's a lot of you know costs and, and different fees that were going into it. And I just, I didn't understand it. I didn't feel comfortable with it. And I think that transparency is the greatest catalyst to scale. And if we want mass adoption, if we want hundreds of thousands of people to be participatory with the sport through the lens of ownership, the only way it's going to happen is through just full disclosure, full transparency. So that will cause some friction along the way because it's never been done before. We're going to basically show people how tough, difficult the game is sometimes to make money. We're going to show people how expensive it is, potentially have horses. We're going to talk about how many times a horse basically is purchased at a yearling sale, never actually gets the track. So all that's going to come to fruition. But I think all that is actually what makes the sport so unique and fun and challenging and exciting. Um, and the goal is to get just a real mass adoption, make ownership as transparent as possible, bring people into the, the sport in a trial capacity, and then allow them to go into different places. Um, we have a lot of people who have already gone off and bought on their own horses already. This is not just a socioeconomic. They come in, they get the transparency, they understand what the costs are. They start understanding that how fragile these animals are and how often they, you know, to, to be you know, right by the horse, how often they need to be turned out. Um, the care that goes on from the vet side, like they come out after a year really educated, which I think is great. You know, empowerment and education is then what drives people to feel confident to allocate capital to anything, right? And if we want people allocating capital to our industry, they've got to understand all the nuances. They've got to understand all the details and going through a low price point product that is real ownership. And I saw some chatter out there that it's not real. It's, it's nonprofit, whatever it is. I mean, it is not the case. It is a fully qualified security. You basically buy this, you are getting, you are along for the ride as if you had basically went there and, and signed title, right? And there's a, a few things that we do to try to make it a little bit easier. We don't require cap calls, things like that. But there is no, no this is not a derivative product. This is a product that, uh, of real equity. And I think through education will come empowerment. I think through empowerment will come capital and enthusiasm. And that's what we're hoping for. And they'll, they'll come at all levels of the game. So I wanted to tr try to hammer down the specific financials because I didn't, I mean, obviously you don't want to do, you don't want to say exactly what the price point was for authentic, but I'm just trying to get a kind of sense because you bought 12.5% is what I read from Bill's story with you. Uh, you have about 4,700 micro, micro shares that you sold. What is like the, the basic level of investment for a horse and, and basic level of return for a horse as successful as authentic? Yeah, so I have no problem. I mean, we, we post everything, all financials. Every one of our documents is, is with the SEC. It's public information. So I have no problem sharing all the details of it. Um, so this horse, we purchased this horse uh, in June, right? This was a made horse. We didn't, we're not the ones that bought this horse at the sale for $300,000. That was SF Bloodstock that wound up picking up that horse. So we had been buying a lot of younger horses and giving people the hope that maybe you'll find your star, right? That's fun. It's the high beta world. But also, there's a lot of disappointment in that world. We all know the numbers of how few yearlings actually wind up entering into the, the, the Kentucky Derby uh, starting gate. And so, you know, buying into expensive horses at that stage in their career, it's, it's a tough financial play unless you feel like you can make money in the breeding shed. And so with our relationship with Spendthrift, with their track record and their su success of buying stallions, we thought they are absolutely the right partner to take this kind of high risk, high reward swing with. So people bought into Authentic. We bought 12.5%, which we made 12,500 shares available, right? So that, that everybody knew exactly what kind of equity they were getting, right? They're getting 0.001%. So you know your equity, right? That sounds like a small number to a lot of people. Go to the stock market, look at what you're buying when you buy a share of Google, add a few more zeros to it, right? The idea is that it's okay to come in with low amounts. I just need to know what percentage I have. I need to know exactly what, you know, what the unit economics are. And then I can decide if I want to buy 10, 50, a hundred, or just one. So they came in for 206. That's on a $15.2 million valuation that we paid for the horse. That's what Spendthrift paid for the horse for their 87.5%. That's what we paid for our 12 and a half. No markups by them. 
we're paying the same deal. So our guy that came in, Mr. Hughes basically paid for, that's what that micro share owner was paying for. But they also did pay for our fee. So we charge 15% to do what we do. So that's kind of the real difference is that we charge a fee to basically take it, take it to one, one share down to 12,500, put the platform together, do that diligence, get it qualified by the SEC, and then you know push it out through our app and provide that, that management service. But if you break down the share price, you'll see the 206 was derived at $15 million valuation, mortality insurance, um, first year stallion insurance. I mean, that's pretty expensive. A lot of people don't appreciate how expensive you know, fertility and first year stallion insurance can be. Um, and then basically uh, some, some money for nomination fees to kind of make sure we had that. And then our fee, and that was it. And so there's not much difference when you break down the math and have anybody go look at that in terms of what was paid by the person who bought 88% and what was the person that was paid by bought 0.001%. Now, the question then becomes, well, how much money did they make? We don't buy a horse for $15 million and expect to be making money on the racetrack, right? You expect that horse to be the best son of into mischief and to go to Spencer Farms and stand and be able to demand high quality, you know, good quality stud fees, bring to great mares and produce on the track. And that's where a lot of money in this game, you know, comes to fruition, right? That's where it manifests itself in, in that shed. And all 12,500 people, well, well 5,000 people, because people bought multiple shares, right, are participatory in the racing and the breeding. So after each season, based on mares covered, live full rates, all that, do your reconciliations, and just like you would in any corporation, you, you redistribute the money pro rata back to the shareholders who came in. And that's what they'll see returned on this horse. On, a, on most other horses, we buy the horse, we sell the horse, we liquidate the company, we pay people back, they make money along, or they get their dif- dividends along the way, but we don't, we're not usually trying to stay on the stallion. This was someone to do something really different that Spendthrift said, this will be the, the best son of into mischief. This is the mile and a quarter horse. That was their commitment from day one when they called us. We think this will be the intermission to get the mile and a quarter. And we think he's going to be a great racing prospect, but even a better stallion. And so let's go for it. We're in. We think that the, the crowd will love it. We love the, the commitment, the diligence, the thoughtfulness that went into it. And that's how that deal came to fruition. Hey, Michael, I want to stay on the same subject uh, and you sort of the dollars and how this all works. As you well know, on because I think on uh, MyRacehorse.com actually reacted to this and put out a statement, there was a lot of, uh, I don't know, I think uproar is not the right word, but a lot of um, questions being asked on social media after the Derby. So uh, the horse wins the Kentucky Derby. That's $1.8 million for the owners. A lot of people got out their calculators and said, oh, gee, I'm going to get a check in the mail for whatever, fill in the blank for my share of 0.001%. In actuality, the people shareholders, the micro share owners are not going to see any money right now from the victory. And could you explain how that all worked and explain to people uh, the, the, uh, what how these kickers are, the, the bonus schemes that are involved with, with most racehorses when they change hands about, you know, if they win this race, there's so much is paid, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you know exactly where I'm coming from. If you could just explain the situation and why maybe there was a misunderstanding among some people who did think there was going to be a check in the mail coming their way. Of the 5,314, we saw very, very few uh, of those people that were participating in the chatter. Um, a lot of the people was, this was a big moment. So they came in uneducated and they, they wanted to look at it and they made some assumptions. But if you watch the people who were participatory, these financials were disclosed. There was emails and FAQs going out about the financials behind this because the financials behind this weren't straightforward, right? The reality was you don't buy SF bloodstock. Owners of high quality horses don't give up on their horses without basically being participatory if those horses go on to success in the racetrack. Many deals that are sold when you're buying the top horses to get into the shed come with performance bonuses back to the original owner. It's a win win, right? I mean, if SF Bloodstock is able to basically participate in the upside of purchasing a derby winner, they want short term money. The stallion owner, we're looking for the long term. We're looking for that increased stud fee. We're looking for the 10 to 15 year appreciation in the asset, right? So the horse wins the Derby. We get our share of $3 million, which is about what, 1.5 million after the percentages and payouts, right? But we owe, we owe the original owner $9 million. So in essence, we, the, the, all the shareholders, they did make 1.5 million. But at the same exact time, they also inherited a $9 million liability because they basically have a horse now 
that has had significant appreciation. And that's the quid pro quo for doing that. My racehorse, Spendthrift, same deal. We got the revenue. We also got the liability. Now, I'm not going to go to 5,300 people and say, hey, guys, you guys just bought Authentic. You just wanted to say congratulations. We actually owe $7.8 million. We got to divide that by the 12,500 owners. So we all need uh, you to send in a check. For, how, how would that have done on Twitter? I said, please send me $75 for the kicker, right? So what we decided to do is that we would put the liability into the company and then we would pay it back once we started getting stallion revenue. So that way you can come in for one fixed fee. You can understand that if you get a derby winner, you may have a really significant stallion prospect. And the complexity which comes in by actually paying that bonus, we removed by not charging the shareholders for it. Having the liability go on our books, we take care of it and we won't pay ourselves back until he actually makes the money. So you're almost getting the best of both worlds, even though the chatter actually became negative. If you break it down, what other situation could you inherit a $7.8 million liability and not actually have to pay out the cash for it? Yeah, and, and Michael, thanks, thanks for the explanation because you're right. A lot of people on social media weren't understanding it and whether they were investors or they were just fans that were kind of coming in to, to kick tires and to, and, and to have a better understanding. There, there certainly was a lot of buzz on social media, which, which is what you want. I mean, when, when you have a partnership like this, you want to have buzz, you want to have people following and everything. So we do appreciate the, uh, the additional um, you know, details on the bonus structure. Um, when you get successful in any business, there's always a concern that there's going to be copycats out there. So what uniqueness does MyRacehorse.com offer um, that, you know, maybe the next um, ABC, you know, Racehorse.com wouldn't be able to replicate that you guys have in place? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And uh, that was kind of my last my last job. We were Casper, Mattress in a Box, and kind of the innovator. And, and overnight, there was, you know, 30 of them that came onto the market. Uh, and I think it just comes comes down to basically continue to make sure that you have the superior product. You know, any when I, if I'm if I'm a, a micro share investor and if I want to get into a, a racehorse and there are new comp- competitors that wind up emerging, whatever it may be, it's going to come down to who's going to give me the best value for my dollar. And you know, we, we built out a very significant tech team to be able to make sure that the digital components of what you're getting are top notch. Uh, we have a really strong media relations. I don't know. Any of you guys follow the, the, the content that the authentic owners got, but even at the Derby in the stakes room, we had people coming up to us saying that my friend bought in this content is amazing. I feel like I'm the full owner. I own hundred percent of authentic. And so we basically developed we aggressively invested in building strong tech, strong media. So you're getting content that is almost even superior in many situations to what you would get as the individual owner because we have scale, we have people on the grounds at every track. We can be, you know, doing interviews back to, you know, exercise rider get off, gets off the, the horse in the morning. All of a sudden we do an interview. It goes to you within 15 seconds. We have scale and what scale is going to mean to individuals. It's going to be a superior product. Right. Um, and you know, that's a big part of why we, can, we partnered with, you know, Mr. Hughes is we have good capital behind us. We're going to have a, a far superior product um, because we can make sure that we invest in it. Uh, I think, you know, but time will tell that proof is in the for that. So that I can say whatever I want. At the end of the day, we got to put good horses on the platform. We got to be transparent. Uh, we got to win a lot of races. We got to give people a great experience. And we're committed to what we call flawless execution and making sure that every owner winds up having, you know, an optimal experience with us. And if that's what happens, we'll win. If it doesn't, then somebody else will take this category. And we're very comfortable with that. The category is going to be massive, right? We believe that we've done anything, everything from the right strategic partnerships to the right type of management team to the right capital allocations um, to basically own this category. But that that will just come down to execution. Let's go back to the the, the initial two hundred six dollar investment. Do you get into the business of projecting earnings like any any uh, S and P company would, um, and and relate that to your owners? Yes. Yeah, so- and as you can imagine, like, you know, for looking statements, you ought to be always careful in, like you said, any S&P company, but these are equity investors. And so we need to provide investor relations. And the reason I don't think the 5,314 owners were a part of that chatter that everybody saw the day after was kind of all the uh, kind of dynamic conversations was because they were getting updates in terms of what this would mean. We looked at different horses that won the derby and how much it improved the stud fee. We looked at projections. We 
did interviews with Ned Toffee. We went to Spendthrift. We basically created a six-minute uh, breakdown video of what it's like to stand a stallion and what it means financially if you can accomplish things. Why was the mile and a quarter so important for a horse like Into Mischief, right? And then we kind of we looked at the top ten in terms of what freshman sires were demanding. We looked at the ones who've had basically legacy and how many mares they've covered over time. And so we're giving people all that clarity. So it's like through the lens of you know, you know, financial assessments, right? You're also learning so much about all the variables that go into, right? The, the business of horse racing, the business of Santa Stallion. And I, I generally believe that's why, you know, our owners weren't participatory in that. Like they, they were given those disclosures. Now, do we put calculators? This is, I've been, I'm sure many, I'm participatory in markets and secondary markets and secondary asset classes and that kind of fun stuff on my personal side, Right. The volatility in racing is incredible. I mean, you can be worth $5 million pre-post time, and you probably couldn't give the horse away post-post time in some situations. So this this high beta, high volatility uh, equity that's associated with you know the sport and at the, at the, you know, we, that we all love, it's, it's challenging. So we provide lots of education on the variables, but we also are very, very careful to all of a sudden come up and say, we think we're now going to stand for $100,000 because this one horse did. And if we went for 15 years, that means we're going to make $147 million on a $15 million investment. It just doesn't feel efficacious, right? So you provide as much transparency, a much scenario analysis, and then let people kind of digest it from where they kind of think it it, it kind of sits, what's moderate. But we're, we want to educate, we want to provide clarity, but we don't want to overly project. And that's that's kind of our focus on it. Um, so far as, uh, you know, you're trying to build a brand, which you've done a very good job of, and what could be better than, and Joe mentioned, the horse carrying your silks in the Kentucky Derby, which I thought was a little bit unusual. If you own 12 and a half percent of him, uh, you would think that the majority owner would, would have the right to have the horse campaign uh, in his silk. So uh, I guess well done, but how, how are you able to pull that off? Uh, well, that really just came in the generosity of B. Wayne Hughes. I mean, at the end of the day, he is so passionate about this product and what it means for racing. He loves racing. It's The energy is infectious in terms of how much he genuinely just loves the sport and wants it to thrive. And we both have the same hypothesis that if, if anyone gets a taste of ownership, they are going to be hooked to the sport. They may, they may get in it professionally. They may become paramutual players. They may stay as owners. They just may become fans that watch it on NBC or on TDN, right? But at the end of the day, if you get a taste of ownership, you're going to get hooked. And so he wanted to use the stage, this platform, to be able to move the brand forward and kind of bring the, the mission to fruition, which was scale. And that's, that's, he, that's what he did. All right, Michael, thank you so much for joining us, for coming on and explaining everything about my racehorse. Huge congratulations, huge success for you guys, and best of luck going forward. I right, much appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Thank Be you. well. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Michael Behrens will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So that's going to do it for this episode of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, Keeneland September starts this Sunday, September 13th. You can stream all the action on september.keeneland.com or the TDN website. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Michael Behrens, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editor is Danny Seiper and Nathan Wilkinson, production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Thank you so much for watching. Wear a mask. See you next week. <laughs>